<clears throat> okay, welcome to H3, the show about hope, happiness, and health. I am the Acapels, and with me is Brother Scott Sweetman. How are you tonight, Brother Scott? <laughs> I just realized uh, <laughs> we usually come on this show and we're either doing something crazy or laughing. And there's one thing I really like about myself. And that's what I laugh with my whole body. Even when I was skinny, I can't, my whole family does. My grandfather, my father did. I, I think it's genetic, but I, I love that feeling when your whole body laughs, right? Uh -huh. wow, that's, that's a great yeah. feeling. That's a, that's a somatic experiencing kind of thing, right? Your whole body. Oh, yeah. That's your vagus nerve saying, you're all right. You're safe. You're, you can heal. You just, you're loved. You're there where you're supposed to be, right? So that's amazing. Yeah. I, way off topic but you know I've, I've traveled a fair bit and i'm always amazed by cultures where laughing is offensive because oh. there's nothing it's like a baby crying there's nothing more natural right like right. baby cries on an airplane of course it's annoying but it's natural the kid's uncomfortable that's the only way it can communicate i'm uncomfortable but it's, i've learned not to scream in public or i yes. would right yes. sometimes i do maybe anyway but still <laughs> you know and uh, yeah, I'm always amazed by cultures where laughing in public is a big no-no because yes. it seems like uh, yeah, I'm not I'm not hacking on those cultures. It's just hard because to me, laughing is like one of those. It's like breathing, man. It's just a, one of the joys of being alive. Beautifully said. Beautifully said. I mean, uh, think about how much you could enjoy this present moment if all you were thinking of was this miracle of breath entering your body, right? Whoo! Like if you're there for that, if you can experience that, life is pretty damn sweet. Well, you know, talking about breath, and I talk about it a lot, but when I almost died from, and I remember going under when I couldn't breathe. Like I remember struggling and fighting. It it took less than 12 hours for when I had trouble breathing to the point that they said I'm dying and uh, put me on a ventilator. What's that called when they trach you down the throat? Anyway, um, and I remember the point where I went unconscious. Like I remember struggling and the fear of not being able to breathe. Like that's oh. not like any other fear. Well, it's terrible, but that's why waterboarding is so effective, right? As a torture. That's why it's been outlawed in most civilized countries. But the West uses it a lot in covert operations because you have all the psycho psychological fear of drowning, but you're not actually drowning. Then right. You don't have to worry about you dying. Yeah. So, yeah. But breath, my point was that breath is holy. If you've ever been forced not to be able to breathe for any reason, and I hope you haven't, people. Uh, yeah, you you revere that breath like that is that is a gift, man. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? Even if you were to experience what somebody who has you know pulmonary problems or uh, you know lung type breathing type problems, with cystic fibrosis or whatever kind of diseases that impact that, if you experience how they breathe or how uncomfortable it is, and then versus how beautiful and and life affirming it is when it's working like it's supposed to, right? I mean, it's a pretty beautiful experience. So, I went to right after we moved off the farm. My parents were divorced, and moved into Red Deer. Um, one of the my little mates in class uh, was extremely asthmatic. Like he had he had asthma attacks all the time, and he was a, just a sweet kid. And he was like physically really small and tiny because, of course. Like he had had asthma since birth. He'd been having problems his whole life. So he wasn't physically really strong, but he had the heart of a warrior. Like if somebody was picking on somebody, he was the first person to be in between them. And uh, it's pretty hard to stand there and fight with somebody. If there's a little guy in between you, turn him blue. Like you're, <laughs> the mood changes. <laughs> but yeah, it, I, I wondered even as a kid what, what he must go through all the mm. time. Like mm -hmm. just, you know, somebody would wear some perfume or cologne and we couldn't even smell it, but it would set him off and, you know, he'd be down and out for an hour. basically. Oh, yeah. Pretty severe yeah. stuff. So tonight, my background is indicative of our, of our topic. I hope, I, I think that rain's a little bit intimate. How does rain make you feel? 
I, I kind of lost you there for a second. How does rain wet, Scott? <laughs> I said, I, the dogs are, somebody came to our door, obviously. Dogs are going crazy. Yeah, don't ever try and break into my house. This is not, not a good plan. Um, yeah. So rain, I think, is intimate. I like it when it rains. It feels like everything sort of closes in a little bit. And everyone's, like on the farm, usually on a rainy day, we worked inside. Everyone kind of came closer together. On a warm day, we were spread all over, you know, two quarter sections but yeah when it rained we were all kind of huddled in and what do you think yeah i'm i i, I get that i make make makes sense you kind of you seek shelter and you're with shelter of other people that are that maybe it's your family maybe it's people you love or maybe it's just people you work with that you enjoy right being in so you you kind of it it's kind of an excuse to connect and talk and and right and you know i, yeah, I can see that or play a game of cards or, you know, that kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, exactly. I, one of my fondest memories, and I remember a lot, even when I was down in West Virginia going to college, I went to Meredith Manor Equestrian College. Corolla would know more about that. But I used to love to sit in the barns. It rained really heavy, and the barns had big barn doors, <laughs> I could figure. And so <laughs> that we'd push the doors open, and we'd all sit on the hay bales. Because we, if you were lucky enough and were booked into an indoor arena, you were okay. But more often than not, you were in an outdoor arena, and yeah, you, most of the time you were supposed to go anyway. But yeah, that was a good time to play hockey. And we'd all sit sometimes with the instructors on hay or straw bales and just kind of let the rain down. And people would talk, but maybe hushed voices. And there's kind of a smell, a dampness that takes over, and the animals kind of quiet down. You can hear them breathing and you know making little lip noises and things. And it's it's quite wonderful. It's very sensual and very very intimate. So tonight's background, I hope, gives that feeling because we're going to talk about um, some things that some people don't like to talk about. Let's hear it, Scott. What are we going to talk about that people are going to be uncomfortable? How are we going to make people uncomfortable tonight is my question. Tonight. <laughs> That's what we were laughing about when we came on. We hadn't really talked about the show. But I was like, okay, here we go. Buckle in because this is this this is our night of tomfoolery and, and, and pure enjoyment. So we're going to talk about, uh, in the next three weeks, really, we have, we're going to talk about health because as H3, hope, happiness, and health, um, I want to make sure we get on those three, right? And Alan's always, uh, always working on those, all three of those. I sometimes tend to get tunnel vision on one or two of them and, and focus, but so uh, what I'd like to talk about tonight is hormone treatment. Great. Which which is for 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 men is kind of a, a new one of those new topics that people talk about more openly, right? Like menopause. People talk more openly about that for a few years, right? But um, men's testosterone replacement treatment, which is uh, what most common men's hormone treatment is. What would you say? Last 10 years, maybe you hear about it? People, not so much. Yeah, I would say. Sure. Yeah. About yeah 10 years. I, most guys don't talk about it. Then the number of people that actually, the number of men in developed countries, uh, North America, Europe, etc., who take testosterone supplements or on uh, testosterone replacement treatment, TRT as it's abbreviated, is really quite high. Is um, it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's, like fifty percent, seventy percent. What kind of numbers are? Oh uh, well, that? no, not not that effect. But it's in the U.S. alone, it's a three point eight billion dollar a year market, and it's doubling almost every year. Wow. Okay. Yeah, so so you, you take testosterone supplements or therapy? Is that I, I do, and that was part of when my pituitary gland got fried when I was going through all the stuff and coma and everything. They only found it out when I was back in uh, intensive care for a surgery that had got infected. And uh, two, two wonderful uh, lady doctors, while I was unconscious there, did some tests and tested my blood and stuff. And they're the ones that came up with the idea that my pituitary gland was cooked. And one of the first things they did was they looked at my testosterone level and they're like, wow, um, you have none. <laughs> like almost zero, none. Like... <laughs> <laughs> you're you're still operational you still have what's what produces testosterone but your blood has like none hmm. it was quite surprising it was incredibly low and uh so that got them off on well okay what's 
what's going on here. Why? Because that's that's one of the important things with testosterone treatment and one of the negative side effects of it becoming popular, right? Mm-hmm. So do, are you aware of some of the ideas they use, some of the things they use to uh, they treat testosterone with? Well, here's what I know, or here's what I believe I know. You can correct me if, if you know more than I do about it, is that one, testosterone for men generally kind of has a has a decline over years over like when you're 25 it's whatever number and then from there it's just kind of a steady decline you can depending on how physically active you are and how much weights you lift and such like that you can reduce the drop but basically through normal type experiences it's going to drop and so then I have testosterone supplementation as well. Probably have had for eight years, 10 years with a little bit of what's it called? Progesterone as well. And so then I think the idea was that would kind of create it back to kind of the level I was when I was like about 40. And then we're just trying to hold it stable at that kind of level, which makes maintaining your weight and maintaining your muscle mass easier. Yeah. And that's, that's, been the the widely held belief and you've talked to a lot a lot of doctors today that's what they'll tell you but they're finding out that that's not quite as true oh as, tell me more. as it was yeah and so the research that i was doing and uh mostly because you know when they said oh you have none of this and i was said well what's normal and they said well that's a good question and i said oh that's an interesting answer what do you mean that's a good question they're like, well, <laughs> it's changing and it's dependent on who you are and your own body chemistry. And there is no sort of magic number, right? Like it's not like blood pressure where we're pretty clear on what zones people start dying on, right? Like if it drops below a certain, it doesn't really matter who you are. Pretty much it's your lights out or too high. And, you know, it's only a matter of time before something goes pop somewhere. Um, testosterone levels are a little tricky and the age actually is 65. They're figuring now is when it starts to be more noticeable in terms of, they used to think it was much lower, but they found that treating younger men is problematic. Hmm, how so? Unless, unless there's a real problem. Dangers. There's, there's some serious dangers to young men. Um, but we'll talk about that and, you know, the things you're talking about, I'm, I'm just reading off a list here so we can all be on the same page. Uh, seven effects of boosting testosterone levels in men. Uh, this comes from a men's health journal. Um, higher energy levels, enhanced sexual desire and performance, increased muscle strength, fat loss, maximized mental health, stress relief and mood improvement, reduced risk of heart attack, stroke, and death. Sounds great, right? Sure. Who Those are all want. good things. Yeah, well, and marketing in developed countries has said, yeah, who wouldn't want these things? And we could make a lot of money off a certain segment of the population of young males who really want more muscle, less fat, more sexual what prowess, whatever. And if you look at the marketing, you really see that it's not being marketed to older guys who actually have a medical need. The marketing is really targeted as a, an enhancement, if you will, to male, classical male virility. Can I say that without like, sure. and it's, it's not, I'm not just like, it's not Viagra, but just the whole more muscle, less fat, more oof. So, so I, I haven't seen, I don't watch much for TV or anything. Yeah. So I haven't seen these ads, but you're saying these ads, which would be in the based in the U S not in Canada, obviously, but right. we'd see them here, but those are very much marketed at like 30 years old. It's kind of a yeah. thing. So I'm right. looking at one right now as an example, that's in this paper. It shows a slender, healthy young man in his maybe mid thirties. He's out running and the, the voiceover is, uh, you know, do you suffer from low sex drive, f- fatigue, moodiness, depression, or other ailments commonly related to aging? Testosterone treatment therapy may be for you. 
Mm-hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And I love your announcer voice. Which you did. <laughs> <laughs> Might be for you. <laughs> that was good. I did my best. But, you know, that's not really saying, you know, to people like me who are saying, oh, you've, you know, got an injury. You need this treatment. Or like your doctor saying, okay, we want to hold it at this level for, for your health reasons. This is moving into that area of performance enhancing, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the problem is, and I mean, if you don't know where testosterone comes from, it's made in our testes, our, our balls, for those of you who don't like Latin. Um, and um, the, one of the big problems with young men is our testes are lazy. And I'm sure many people would attest to that. Um, and if younger men get testosterone treatment, their testes stop producing it. They're like, meh. What? We don't need to, we don't need to do this work. And uh, that causes... Wait, and what, how, how is it that our testes for men produce uh, testosterone? Is it like through ejaculation? Is no, it no, how, no. like... No, no nothing, nothing to do with sex drive. They're just, they create the hormone. Okay. And it's just created in your testes and then just, uh, just, it stays there or it goes through your bloodstream. No, it goes through your bloodstream, yeah. right? Yeah. No, well, that's why in traditional classic societies, eunuchs were, were considered safe around women, right? They were effeminate. They lost in animals. If you geld or castrate, like I, we don't castrate our, or, or neuter our dogs unless there's a medical reason to do it because it, there's been a big problem when we were in Japan, there's a big movement against it because the American Vet Association has pushed castration because it's like the number two money-making operation. I'm going to get flamed by a bunch of vets now. But uh, it's testosterone. Our testes are important to produce secondary sex characteristics, right? So if you geld too soon, if you castrate your male dog too soon or spay or your female dog, they don't develop those secondary characteristics and those aren't just bad behavior those are required for health um and in other countries they don't see yes in north america we think boy you're irresponsible if you don't spay or neuter your animals well i since growing up in the farm where we neutered everything we wanted to get fat and keep in a fence um that was just good business uh, I haven't neutered any of our animals unless it was important or, or medically necessary. And they've never had an accidental pregnancy ever because we manage them. It's like having teenagers, um, you know, N- not saying that if your teenagers have gotten pregnant, you've mismanaged them. But, uh, you know, it goes a long way. And, uh, you know, and accidents do happen. Let me just back up for just a minute. Yep. But you're saying for the ads that are geared towards young men to do testosterone, testosterone therapy, it's counterproductive to their health because then instead of a natural body occurrence of them producing their own testosterone by their testes, their testes will just say, oh, I don't have to do any work here. I'm getting, I got enough flowing in here. I don't have to do this kind yeah, of. It's, it's almost impossible to wean young men off of it because their, their testes just stop and they shrink. They, they physically shrink. And, really? uh, yeah, and there's all sorts of um, associated issues with um, – now, it's one of those things, right? And there's money involved. $3.8 billion in growing every year exponentially is not small change, and there's motivation behind that. And I think you're anyone who thinks that Big Pharma is completely out for the our best interests and not the bottom – they're corporations, man. Their number one job is to reduce dividends for their shareholders. That's a simple fact. There's no, there's no myth in that, right? No, no conspiracy theory here, folks. That's just what it is. Yeah, Um, and so there's there's motivation on both sides. You see studies that say, oh, it's perfectly safe, and then you see other studies that say, no, it's not. And quite honestly, from what I've been reading, the truth is most of the studies done academically and without being sponsored by people against or for it. Yeah, it's becoming a problem. Uh, there was a bunch of products that I was looking at. It's really interesting being in marketing. I was looking at the products because, you know, people say, oh, there's a monetary gain. Well, all you have to do to prove that is are people producing products targeted at that market, right? So here, 
Let's see, this is my personal stuff. I'm going to share this with you. This is my little box of <laughs> man juice, um, testosterone, as I call it. Um, and it's it's called Andro Gel. It's a 1% gel. It comes in these little nondescript packets, I guess. And uh, I have to rip these open. And uh, it's like hand cleaner. Uh, and it just is absorbed into your skin. There's little directions on the back because people are are stupid. And it says, don't apply this directly to your genitals because that would be a no-no. Don't directly apply this to your heart. That would be another no-no. Apply it to your areas where you have body fat or muscle that can absorb it slowly and without putting undue stress on your body. So, Are you, still, are you sp supposed to rotate where you apply it? Like if uh, you are No? My doctors say just... It doesn't matter. Just don't doesn't put it on on your nether nether yeah. Do you know what nether yeah is? No nether yeah. I've never heard it. Yeah, before. in the original in the <laughs> this is the fun you can have at the Cambridge Library in an afternoon, a rainy oh. afternoon at that. Nether yeah is a word that Chaucer used to describe your nether regions or oh. your downstairs business. Got it. So, okay. Yeah. Yeah. And right. I there was a big debate that I heard going on. Whether what part of you in particular Chaucer was referring to in that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'll believe we'll that to the academics. But yeah, oh, um, so yeah, they don't put it in your mouth, don't put it over your heart, don't put it on your nether yeah, your nether regions, and it's all good from from there. So for me, okay. it's just I'll put it on my shoulders or my tummy or whatever whatever's convenient at that moment it dries quite quickly um they're uh not cheap in the u.s it, on average it's about 400 dollars a month for a man uh often not covered by insurance wow uh, yeah I, for I i so i can tell you that mine like i i'm sure i have a different dose and everything right but mine they make it at stafford pharmacy so it's uh -huh. a it's one that they create there into a cream, compound. Yep. compound. And right. so it, it has testosterone and progesterone and it is covered under my plan. Um, it's not direct build. I have to pay for it and send it in, but it is covered under my plan, uh, under my drug plan. And it's about uh, the little tube of it that I get that I, it's got like a pump thingy on it. It's mm -hmm. good for like, it's just like one squeeze of that pump every day uh but it's good for like i don't know two months maybe three oh, wow. like it, it's good for it's good for quite a while yeah so this is how i get it is that's how you get it okay and that's yeah. how big a supply is that for you a month. how long is that a month i have to a take month. and i was so this we'll get into this and this is the other risk um these are uh, and again you know we're sharing this. I, I, I don't like talking about, you know, the fact that I have no natural testosterone. And yes, I still do have my testes and they function perfectly well. Thank you. Um, but <laughs> thanks for clarifying that, Scott. That's I, I had to. My my man virtue insisted that I defend the, honor the, the man box <laughs> in me says, Defend your testes, man. Stand up for those things. Um, but I'm sharing this because I don't think everyone knows this. And I've, I've talked to a lot of young guys. And it's not something they're taught. It's not something they talk about. A lot of doctors are either for it or against it. Like when I talk to some younger men that have problems, they're like, no way. My doctor, he's like, won't even he's, no. <laughs> and uh, sorry. I was just going to say, I mean, a great place to start if you think it might be a value to you, but you don't want to take it. If it's not going to be a value, if it's going to be actually detrimental because it shuts down your natural testosterone production, right? You don't want that. But a good place to start would be to do a test to figure out what your level's at, right? And if you're a young person today, if you're 35 and you take it, you're probably going to find that it is fine. There's nothing wrong with your testosterone. So adding it, taking it won't do you any damn good. But, but then you'd have a base mark as well that yeah. maybe you check it again in 10 years. Oh, it has dropped now, right? And I want to res restore it to that previous level. So I'm, I'm a crusader for this. Uh, I think that men need to get tested a lot more. And I also don't, like I know for me, 3,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day is what I need. 
If I take that every day, I don't get sick. I feel great. And that's a huge dose. That's much higher than, and I know people who take 10 times that much and are, have no ill effects at all. Don't even get an upset stomach. Nothing. It's what they need. Because the, the level of vitamin C that's recommended, they've never been able to determine that. That was set as a best guess, right? And when I talked to the doctors, my two female doctors about this, and I said, what's the level? They're like, zero is, we know, is not a good level. Uh, so we're pretty safe in this one. Um, but, you know, talking about risk. So I was just saying, I used to take two of these. These are one, what are these? You got to move the one, I do the little trombone thing so I'm not wearing my bifocals. What are these things? These are five grams a piece, 50 milligrams, 1% of whatever's in them testosterone so i used to take two and a half dosage whatever that is but my uh prostate what's that the other test they do for prostate cancer prostate something antigen psa the yeah. prostate prostate something antigen test yeah and they mine went up right and yeah. so my doctor was like whoa we're gonna back that off and um, I was like, oh, because quite honestly, I felt a lot better. For me, the, the two things happened. When, and I, I thought it was just the way I was normally. Didn't affect my sex drive. Uh, I'm like all men all the time. We want it. The more we can get, the happier we are. That's just a man thing. So we can deal with that. Uh, those of you that aren't like that, good on you. Most of us are like that. Al smiling. He's not touching this one with a 10-foot pole. Um, but anyway, for me, I, emotionally, I'm a pretty sensitive guy, usually. It made me incredibly sensitive. Like, I'd start crying for, like, no reason at all. None. Wasn't even sad. Without without the testosterone, you're yes. saying. Is that yes. correct? Okay. Yes. Yeah. All right. And my desire to achieve went. Okay. And, okay. like, just didn't. I wasn't depressed. I just, it was like, man. And I kind of equate that to geldings, right? When you, like, I grew up on a ranch. I mean, you see a gelding, a mare in heat goes by, and he's like, man, you know, we're a stud. Like, I'll charge through two barn walls and a barbed wire fence and electric fence and over top of two ranch hands. And uh, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I lost most. Of so for you, it, you felt more emotional than you felt comfortable with let's put it that way and oh, kind of ap apathetic right you just like right. didn't care no exactly and and i didn't notice i mean the weight was from the pituitary gland it had nothing to do with the testosterone because the weight came i don't know anyway they they don't think that's they think it's the pituitary gland i guess it's all rolled into one um but and muscle loss i haven't experienced any particular great muscle loss or anything like that for me it was uh, do we just out of curiosity do we like do we when we archive these or store these or somebody can find them again do we like put what we talked about in the subject or something uh we do i've been slack the last month kind of two weeks um because okay. we are re-relaunching re -launching the site but i do tag them and i, I will tag them i'll, I'll make sure they get tagged it's okay. important Right. Well, yeah. Like, I mean, I think that our conversation here would be of uh, value to other people to hear. Right. And, you know, if they're considering whether it makes sense or not and they kind of have. All right. Well, maybe you want to get it tested first. Right. And and here's maybe the, the things that it will help solve for you. Right. That kind of a thing to get the number on it, at least anyways, where it's at as a benchmark so that even if you don't need it, then. You check in 10 years, you check in another 10 years. And, and if you see where it's becoming lower than what you'd like it to be, then a little bit of supplementation will probably make sense at that time. Well, yeah. And I, I think that I think very much it's an it's an important thing to to be monitoring yourself. Ultimately, we're responsible for our health. Right. Like, you know, I, I know that there's times that I should have disagreed with my doctors and said no or said yes. I will go to another doctor and I will get this done. I don't care. Right. Because ultimately we're the people who have to live with it. You it's know, true. and I've had doctors say to me, cool, if you want it, I'll get it for you. If it kills you, 
It's on you, not on me. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. And and I think that's perfectly acceptable. I think that we that we farm out too much responsibility in our society. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. I'm responsible for me. You're responsible for you. If we had more of that, then we could be happy. Right? Mm -hmm. We could start celebrating. Because I think when you give that power away, you lose the ability to celebrate the good stuff too. Yeah. And you know what? I just on the same kind of a theme, you know, you're talking <laughs> about your vitamin C. You know, you need huge, yeah. huge things way beyond what the normal RDA. Yeah. Absolutely. And that's that's because you kind of had experimented with you. Like you're, yeah. you know, you're aware of yourself, you're paying attention, you're monitoring how it changes in your what things you put in your body affect you and your health and your energy levels, that kind of thing. And that's what we all have to do, right? There's no one thing one size fits all i don't think we've got different body types and compositions and shapes and sizes and activity levels and you know really we kind of have to tailor you know what solutions we're putting into our life or what changes we're putting into our life for our bodies right and, and, and our, i'm not saying to run out and take three thousand milligrams of vitamin c it might kill you i have no idea but yeah. i know from and i get tested a lot and i think one of the things we don't do in in the west we overdo it on one hand. I think we get over-treated and under-tested. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Like over the counter, we can buy stuff in the West that you can't get anywhere else in the world without a prescription. Mm. Why? Because it's not good to take in huge amounts. Like mm. I, I know kids that take Tylenol after drinking, right? Mm -hmm. They, they have, wake up with a headache. They, have, they were drinking an hour and a half ago. And they take a handful of Tylenol. It can't hurt me. You can buy it at the drugstore. Mm -hmm. Heck, it can't hurt you. You just killed a whole bunch of your liver. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Like, but you can get it in a drugstore. It can't be bad for you, right? Right. You know. So I'm pretty big on. Yeah, uh, you've got a responsibility to know what you're putting in your body or what you need to put in your body, and taking responsibility for that. That but makes anyways. sense. And one one thing that we've said on this show before that I agree is like makes perfect sense. And I think you do as well. The only difference between medicine and poison is dose. Right. And so you want to basically take the minimal amount to get the positive effect, not more than that that it ends up having a damaging effect on your body, right? Whatever that right. compound, whatever you're putting in your body, whatever it is. That's where I was going with this whole dosage thing. So at two and a half, my uh, PSA was up, right? My prostate, whatever, whatever. Yeah. But only for one, one test. And so they, sh they shut it down by half. I was taking two and a half. She took the half out and it went down. Or the next test, it was down, right? And she said, yeah, I, I've never met her in person, uh, Dr. Kazi, wonderful doctor. I am not worthy to be her patient. Oh, she is oh. brilliant, saved my life. So many doctors have saved my life. So many of them have almost killed me oh. by telling me bad stuff, but there's some great ones out there. Anyway, Dr. Kazi, sorry if I'm not allowed to say your name. How many doctors do you think that you've had that you've experienced treatment with? I bet you it's 100, eh? Oh, at least, yeah. At yeah. Least. yeah, yeah. Yeah, when I was yeah. intensive care, like when I was yeah. in coma, they, like the money, like, wow, in Japan, yeah. like the tests and the machinery and the specialists and to keep me alive for four and a half months in induced coma and treat me and run the test. Like they ran four or five tests on my bacteria level every day. They were trying to type this thing because it was new. They didn't have, they couldn't find what it was that was doing this and yeah, like crazy. Million, million dollars worth of medical care, probably, for that four probably. and a half months. Yeah, probably, yeah. yeah. But I interrupted you. You were just saying about Dr. Fozzi and how amazing yeah. she so was. Anyway, so anyway, we so we had the tests. And she monitors them all the time. Never met her in person. We talk on the phone. Um, and that's a great thing that we have going on in Alberta, man. And you've brought it up lots of times. Telehealth in Alberta is a lifesaver. You know, there's ads on right now saying, oh, we can't get in to see the doctor. And if you vote this person, you'll get more doctors. And meh, you can get a doctor anytime you want in Alberta. Learn to use a hey, telephone, yeah. right? Now, sure, that's like, of course, there's times, you know, like Kat has, you know, she got hurt and she waited six hours to get into a doctor in emergency. Unacceptable, right? But I don't need to be clogging up emergency. I can get a hold of Dr. Causey. We make an appointment. We talk on the phone. She has all the tests in front of her. I have them in front of me because now in Alberta, 
and I, I, maybe it's all of Canada, but in Alberta, I can see the test sometimes faster than the doctor. I log into my health, what's it called? You, you know oh, portal, called, I think. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I go through my health portal. I'd register, prove who I was, blah, blah, blah. Now I see the same test results the doctors do. It's because it's my right. It's my body. The government recognizes that this is not something that should be kept from me, right? So right. when she's talking to me, we're looking at the same data. She's explaining it to me. She's saying, well, you know, the one test was there. We changed this, this changed, but that's only one test. It's six months. It doesn't tell us anything, right? So, and I felt better at two and a half. And so now we're in a discussion and she's, she's very open to that. She's like, how you feel is really important. Like, okay, prostate cancer could end your life, but so could being unhappy and not living a quality life, right? Like there's, and as a doctor, I really respect that. Cause she's saying, you know, you've got to make that call, buddy. Yeah. You know, there's risks either way. Now yeah. I'm sure if it was cut and dried, she would say much more strongly, but right. She's very honest. And she says, yeah, I, I don't know. She said, let's, let's back off for another test cycle, you know, put up with it until then. You think you can put up with it? Yeah. 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 That's not that bad. It's just, I felt better at two and a half. And, uh, you know, a little more stable, a little more happy, a little more, you know. And and my level of driven and happiness is way different than yours or anyone's, right? Like, that's all relative to you. So, that's right. Um, Even anyway. if you think about health in general, Scott, you know, health isn't like, you know, um, climbing Mount Everest or lifting more weight, the most weighted in the world kind of a thing or anything like that. It's being able to do the things that are important for you, the activities that are important for you, and to be able to have the energy to engage in life fully and kind of spend the time with people you love and spend the time being of service and spend, you know, that that you can kind of navigate life with enough uh, wellness, enough energy to be able to contribute in a fulsome way, a way that has meaning for you, right? That's really what it is. So it's, 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 totally on what is important for you to do. If it's pick up your grandkids and, and, and be able to hold them in your arms for, you know, an hour while you're talking to them or something, that's health, like to be able to do that. Right. So, you know, it's kind of health is really a broad array of capacities based on interest is kind of the way I think it makes sense. That's a great way to, a great way to say it. I, I know that uh, when I regularly saw an internist, a specialist, um, it was funny, you know, when it was really bad, I was like 620 pounds. Right. And I like, that was came on in months and I, I had never been like, I've been Alberta boy chunky, but never like overweight. i still was very active and did stuff and whatever. And, uh, he would laugh cause my blood test would come back and he said, yeah, if I saw your blood test, you're healthier than I am. He said, you have no co comorbidities. You don't have diabetes. You don't have anything your cholesterol level is fantastic he's like you're just he said you're perfectly healthy but you're frail he said if you fell down right now we'd be in big trouble right you'd probably break your hip and then mm. you know and like you said it's this weird conundrum right like you take somebody else and they're skinny they run 10 miles every day and then you hear from your neighbor they dropped dead of a heart attack right like mm -hmm. so health is not just that, that perfectly clear kind of message, right? It, it's interactive and it should be, yeah. right? It's the, it's the sport of living. That's what I want to start promoting, the sport of living life, right? The sport of living life. All right. That's, that's really nice, Scott. I like that. <laughs> Well, and, and going back to the testosterone and the treatment, and yeah, Al and I were talking before the show, is that we'd really like to get uh, a woman on here to talk about menopause, because Al and I uh, probably know a lot of bad jokes, but the reality that we know about it is probably small. Um, I know a little more because I've had to do a lot of research into hormone stuff for myself. But Well, you Scott, know, I, can have, I have a little tiny bit of empathy now that I had never had before. Because every once in a while now, I have a hot flash. Oh, my goodness. That is not comfortable at all. You know, I would always, you know, we'd be, it's like winter. And the, and she's like got the windows down and I'm freezing my ass off, got my park on. But she's having a hot flash. And, and so now I've had a hot flash. It's not fun. I don't like it much. 
No, my uncle told me a long time ago, he said, you know, men go through menopause. I'm like, oh, come on, what are you talking about? My uncle's a wonderfully honest man. I love him. And he said, uh, they're really proactive on getting tested, though. They're always getting checkups and tested. And, and it's preserved their life. Uh, both my aunt and uncle have fought cancer. They've both survived cancer. They're both, you know, fighting stuff. And uh, he said, yeah. He said, if you ever want to talk about it, he said, come to me. He said, you know, I've been through it. And uh, he said, it's real. It's, it's, it's whatever. He said, it's real. He said, if you're going through something, talk to me. And that's sort of where I'm at with the testosterone. Like when I was in my tattoo shop getting my tattoo, just a bunch of guys in there. And uh, I got talking about testosterone. And I'm like, hey, you guys had yours checked? And they're a mixed group. And, you know, they were all men. Some of us were straight. Some of us weren't. Uh, and I, I never got, oh, we have a visitor coming on. Uh, sorry, that was just Jess. Sorry. <laughs> you're doing great just say no no stop talking <laughs> no, no no it's all right i didn't notice that he was here before and uh, i kind of enter him and then have him leave the room i don't know if it makes any difference but i'm just doing it now so i hope the other part was working i think it was i thought we were somebody coming on here to tell me i'm nuts and decline you're you're doing <laughs> great sorry for yeah. sorry for throwing you off your stride there. No, no, no. So, i mean there we were all different in every aspect of our lives like social economic orientation age you name it there and but there was like six of us in there and i got i said i said to all of them because everyone was you know you're sitting there for a long tattoo and everyone's kind of like you know trying not to stare at your tattoo artist or whatever you're trying to do and uh, we get talking and one of the guys says yeah he said you know I've been really going through this patch where I don't know what's wrong. And my doctor says, you're healthy. And he said, I don't feel healthy. I don't feel right. He said, you know, I don't feel like I have any drive anymore. I don't feel sexually interested. I, I just, you know, getting out of bed is a hassle. He's like, it's not that I'm unhappy. And I'm like, man, have you been tested? And he's like, yeah, once. But my doctor said, yeah, it's within the range. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, have you been tested since? He's like, no. And I'm like, do you have all these symptoms? And the doctor says he doesn't know what they are. Yeah. And I said, have you asked him to do another test? No. That's his job. I'm like, no, it's not, you fool. It's your job. It's like prostate tests. Men don't like getting a prostate test. I mean, but we can be big boys. If women can go in and saddle up into those stirrups, and I think that we can bend or over. Bend up, just, where they... Where the the breast exam thingy, where they're in the clamp diaper. Oh, that looks yeah, like, like, oh. I, I can I bruising that thing, right? Like oh yeah, you know? that that and, doesn't look like fun at all. Yeah. So and now finally men are starting to say it. You know, celebrities are talking about prostate exams, and it's like cool, you know, bro kind of thing, prostate month. But uh, testosterone, low testosterone, and, and the effects that affect a lot of people in a lot of different varieties but i just wanted to talk about something i, I skipped over and i want to touch back on it because it, it's disturbing to me and and that's about how it's become a marketing issue and a money issue and there are companies now in the us i'm sure other places probably canada that have testosterone treatments that look like roll-on deodorants you can go to the gym and take your testosterone treatment you can have it sitting in your you know, medicine cabinet, no one knows you're taking it. And, you know, it's marketed in bright colors so it doesn't look like it's medicine. And, you know, for me in marketing, I can tell you it's like cherry flavored tobacco. Cherry flavored vape tobacco is targeted at kids. You know, 65 year old man says, oh, well, I can't get enough of that candy floss vape. You know, <laughs> ah, they're targeting an age group. Yeah. And and the same with these products, and you can find them online. You know, they're underarm gels that look like roll-on deodorant, and so that's oh. you're you're saying that's irresponsible. It's all in the pursuit of money, and it's not. It's that people are not co informed enough consumers to be making a good choice about this. They're just being led that you need to buy this stuff because it's going to make your well, life better. It, it's you you know I in the day when I was a college student. Um, and yeah, when I was a college student, um, I used to like to not have to sleep 
And I used to like to go for like 20 hours a day. That's kind of my personality. I consider sleep a, a waste of time. You know, I read somewhere that you sleep, I don't know, like a quarter of your lifetime or something. And I'm like, what? We live for such a short time anyway. I'm not sleeping for a quarter of my lifetime. And at, at that time, anyone who went to the doctor, this is 1980s. If you went to a doctor that you know, and the names would get passed around. And you said, yeah, I'd like to lose, you know, 30 pounds for my sister's wedding. They would write you up a script for amphetamines, right? Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. Diet pills. It was right. speed. It was prescribed speed. That's what we were using it for. It wasn't because we were 20 pounds overweight. The doctors knew what it was for. And, you know, and fair enough. It didn't kill anyone I know. Um, it made me really sick until I said, whoa, this is not good with my personality because I don't like to sleep to begin with. And, you know, you can only push your body so far. Right. We were all stupid in college. And I was like, what, 16 when I started college? So I was extra stupid. And, oh, you know. The, and, you were 16 when you started college? Yeah. I left high school and went down to the States. And, uh, well, July, I had just turned 17. When I left, I was 16. And when I started, I was 17. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. You're anyway. like, you're super smart, eh? No, no, it's not that at all. It's a private college. So private if, college? You, if you could pass the test and pay the money, you could go. So yeah. Well, you still had to pass the test. So you're a pretty damn you good student yeah. to be able to pass the yeah. test, weren't you? It was my principal who recommended it because I was bored. But we're all, we can talk about that another day. Anyway, okay. so yeah, my point is, is that it's becoming, you know, a young guy goes into the doctor and he says, yeah, doc, you know, I really want to get some muscle mass and it's advertised. You know what to say. Like I said, during the eighties, if you went into a, an ordinary doctor and said, Oh, you know, I've been trying to lose 15 pounds for my sister's wedding and I want to look good in the pictures. And they're like, okay, you know, here's a script for some, you know, what amphetamines, speed, whatever. And that's just what happened. You knew what to say and that's what you did. And it's not like I was a bad kid. I mean, upper middle class group of people like it was not you know there was much much worse going on it was the, the the high time for cocaine i mean it was big during the 80s that kind of stuff anyway so in my research it's becoming a problem where a young guy can go into a doctor and say yeah you know i don't feel i don't feel sexually driven and you know i'm having a lot of trouble maintaining my my muscle mass to be healthy and what do you think about you know some testosterone and yes yeah, like yeah sure whatever burp and it's a problem is that every doctor no it's very small i'm sure but it's happening and people that don't necessarily need it and i'm not judging that but you know, pr prostate cancer in young people. It, too much testosterone can cause heart attacks. It can cause, there's a whole list, just Google testosterone replacement risks and you will get a lot of academic papers. You will get a lot of nonsense, um, but look for the academic stuff. Um, here's some simple stuff. And I know when I was uh, bouncing uh, to pay for a university, there were bouncers who were taking animal testosterone and animal steroids to bulk up, right? And they suffered, uh, they used to be called bitch tits. Sorry, that's what they were called. And, and that's where they get man boobs from the testosterone, right? So mm -hmm. some of the side effects of testosterone are acne, oily skin, lower sperm count, because like I said, our testes are lazy. And, uh, and it can cause permanent infertility in young men. That's a big one. Like, you know, yeah, okay, you get some extra muscles, you feel power, and you know, in your early, late 20s, early 30s, and then you decide you want to have kids, and you can't. Why? Because your testes have taken a permanent holiday. And, you know, that's if they told you that, if they said, okay, you know, I'll write you the script, but here's what you're risking, and you may not care well, now. I, yeah. I want to make sure I'm following you because, I mean, you're like pro testosterone, but then anti-testosterone given the circumstances what i'm hearing you say so no, i'm go ahead go ahead no, so go ahead. here's what I'm, here's what i understand you to be telling teaching me tonight that testosterone can be beneficial for yeah. some males at any age at any age 
Yeah. But if you, it's something that you don't need and you take it, you can actually impair your health instead of and promote your health or enhance your health is you what can, you're saying. You so I diet. think you're saying as well, a recommendation would be test it, get it tested, know what that number is. So before you'd ever start with supplementation and, and that's kind of the starting point. Would you agree? Uh, absolutely. And I, I think that trusting, finding a doctor you trust is critical. Yes. Like, to, to men and women of any age, in any situation, if you don't trust your doctor, get another one. And remember, one of the fundamental rules of medicine is a second opinion. I have never had a doctor get angry because I said, hey, do you mind if I ask another doc what they think? Usually they say, no, cool. Here's somebody I know. You know, we don't always see eye to eye, but they'd be good to check out and see what they think. And I've had lots of doctors say to me, yeah, you know what? I think this, but I really want somebody else to look at this. Mm. And, you know, when I was in Asia, a doctor's word is final. A nurse can't question them. A person never questions them. Like I, I know the first for uh, the first uh, baby clinic, once Fleur knew she was pregnant, the first baby clinic she went to, she asked questions. And the nurse, you know, pulled her aside and said, oh, we don't ask the sensei questions. He will tell you what you have to do. And Fleur was like, yep out of here sayonara you know uh because but that's culture right and some people are comfortable with that i'm not not hacking on that but i'm saying who somebody who's seen a heck of a lot of doctors some good and some bad some lifesavers i i owe a dozen doctors my life but if you don't trust trust your doctor wouldn't you agree al that's somebody you should absolutely trust above your banker, above your insurance, above anyone. If you don't trust the person making life and death decisions or helping you make them, find somebody else. Well, further, you had already touched on this, and this is a real important point, too, about taking responsibility for your health and being a student of you, right? What activities, what foods, what things that I put on my body have a positive effect and what things are oh, I don't have enough of this, or oh, I'm using too much of this substance and it's actually having a, a damaging effect or non-helpful effect, let's put it that way at least, instead of a positive effect, right? I have, through hard experience and, and slow learning, I have found that more is not always better. Who knew? That's the way I thought it always worked. More must be better. If your car can go 100 kilometers an hour, and then you make it go 150 kilometers an hour or 200 kilometers an hour. That's got to be a better thing. But sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's not. And sometimes that one time is worse than all the times that it was better. That's yeah. true. That's true. And, uh, you know, it's it really is something I think that, that culture plays a, a really negative role in this. Because, because one of the purposes of culture is to normalize behavior. Right. And that that's positive on, on one hand. You don't want a bunch of like, <laughs> you know, you don't want people running around killing each other. You don't want people running around, you know, pooping on your doorstep or whatever. But like Scott, culture. You know, Scott, you know what? If there's no rules, a couple guys could just go on and live stream for like an hour. Just talk say about whatever, whatever the hell they wanted. <laughs> <laughs> like how is it that we could do this this is like amazing <laughs> that we could have this conversation right anybody who watch it and we don't care what the hell? Well, they, and they can turn us off that's exactly. that's their ultimate power they can cancel us click we're gone we don't want to watch that guy anymore or those guys yeah, anymore. done but I, I really do think that there's a lot of cultural pressure right and i, I think that cultural pressure tells us what to eat. Like in Japan, when I was there, the government was advertising for people to eat potatoes because potatoes have nutrients that rice doesn't. And so the government had done a lot of studies that a rice only diet is good for you to a point. And that point is when it becomes only, right? Where, you know, a traditional Japanese diet used mountain potatoes and other forms of starch, we're a modern Japanese since, since the war. Go ahead. I was just going to say, did you ever watch the story of us? 
It's uh, I think it's on Prime, the story of us. But basically, it's kind of the evolution of humans and like where we all, you know, everybody's every, everybody's grandma is a is a black woman that was in this area, kind of a thing. We all yeah. came from from yeah. this area, and we were all black to start with. So everybody's got a gra a black grandma in their in their past, right? Mm -hmm. Um. So, anyways, but the point that they made about uh, about China, Asia, uh, the rice production that it was so, you know, big, big carbohydrates to their diet and your brains, our brains developed and grew way better with that carbohydrate fuel for our brains, right? So then there was all this progress that happened because we we're getting enough fuel, especially carbohydrates, to make our brains work optimally. That's, that's the argument for... Uh agriculture right when we discovered agriculture a lot of society and culture occurs after that and it's yes. because we had a stable source of calories right so right. our health in general was, but, was better but it became too um too and it, all the diversity went away and all the monocrop or few crop type things then uh overall were impactful on our health because we are lacking the diversity of nutrients as well, right? So, like that, if you think of, I told you about my uh, my Blackfoot friend Abby Somaga. Did I tell you about him? Okay, so his basically concept is all of the whole food natural plants that you find, whether it's a tree or a shrub or a root or a berry or a mushroom or bark off a tree, whatever it is, has healing properties to it right? Mm -hmm. All of them. And it's just kind of a matter of understanding which one somebody might be lacking or need that kind of a thing, right? But the, it's all there on the land that just naturally grows if you even go out and find it, right? And and a lot of it as well is just so, so nutrient dense and so uh, complete in nutrients, you know, we'll say vitamin C. Oh, well, this has vitamin C. So we extract one thing out of this whole food, right? But yeah. in that whole food, there could have been, you know, 18,000 different nutrients, right? And like, we know about seven of them, right? You know, there was, there could be a whole complex that we've never studied, have never isolated because nobody decided to make enough money doing it or, you know, that kind of a thing to, I, that's the way I see it anyways. Whole that's one of the, the dangers of ruining the rainforest, right? Because there's more, more. So, you know, we talked about bio, bio availability, right? With uh, curcumin, that black pepper makes more of it bio, bio, biolly available to our bodies. We can take more of what's good in curcumin for us. If we also take black pepper at the same time, right? right? Scientific study, not, not hearsay. Right. And there's a big concern that the most diverse biosystem in the world is the rainforest. And mm -hmm. so there's there's compounds and relationships in nutrients and all sorts of things that exist only in the rainforest. And yes, like you said, we may have one part of it here, but it's much that that complexity is actually what's important and we burn it up we tear it down to grow cash crops and you know and it's true it's very easy for us in the west because we've you know trapped all the beavers and killed all the wildlife and went through our period of rap you know rapid well not quite we're still in it um but you know to look at south america and say yeah well don't cut the forest down you're going to ruin the world that's kind of a one-sided argument, right? Because we did all those things to build up our economies and our civilizations and cultures. So it's a really complex issue, but I think that we're in a, I don't think we could afford to keep narrowing what's available to us. Right. You know what we're going to talk about, I think we got to wrap up today. Right. So, but yeah, let's, let's, let's move on. But I want to talk more about, like things that we can do that will contribute to our health and the health of others. Well, we on um, we're there's a new show coming up right next yeah. week. We're going to launch the first one. Uh, I'm I'm behind the scenes, but um, you, can you share that now a little bit? Sure. No. Okay. So 
Uh, you might know that my day job is an employee benefit specialist. So I get to work with caring employers who value their team members and want to keep them healthy so that their company can be healthy and their company can do what it, the difference it wants to make in the world. So we have this uh, initiative, this dream, this it's not a dream. It's gonna. It's happening. But it's called the Caring Employers Healthy Teams Collaborative. And basically, it's where we, employers in our community in Southern Alberta, get together to form a buying block. And as a buying block, we can buy the same coverages that we have now, but make them better and pay less money for them and have longer rate guarantees as well so that we can get better value. But more importantly, more importantly than that is that we collectively, collaboratively can share best practices. What things can we do that increase the health and well-being of our team members, right? And so we collectively, we know all the answers. So basically it's just kind of encouraging the people who know to to share with those that don't and say, ah, look at that. Here's a, here's a good thing. So I have some things to share, but we have the, on our first episode we're going to have, which is going to be at the nest right beside honkers pub 4 30 next Wednesday, May 3rd. So we're going to have this event. It's a live event and it's going to be streamed as well. So you can check it out. Either way, we'd encourage you to come and see you and get a hug from you. Maybe that would be lovely. But uh, so it's going to be about kind of how what kind of values is buying block going to do? How can it make a difference? And so come and find out. I think you'll uh, I think you'll enjoy it. We'll have some fun. Scott, the, the pre- Go sorry, ahead. just before we pull out, I, I just want to say hello before we log out. Um, I, I just want to say that the the energy behind that is the power of truth and sharing it's like why we come on here and share all kinds of stuff that probably our family and everyone's going oh my god i can't believe they said that Mm -hmm. um you know and our kids are going to watch this and say holy cow i want to delete that from the world Mm -hmm. uh because there's power in it right i I hope that sharing the fact that you know i spread this little gel over myself and it makes my life better and there are risks attached to it and you need to go out and find out about that I hope that helps one person out there. And that's yeah, like, that's great. You bet. You know, you bet. So, and I think that's what's behind uh, the collective and the cooperative is just people trying to get together, share ideas, share concerns and say, how can we make it better by working together instead of in our own little corner? Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and I think you already know this, Scott, but we're also looking for, it's not just the employers, but it's the team members themselves, right? We want to make sure they're experiencing and using their benefits is great. But also, if they have something to contribute to, hey, here's a health tip that we use or that I do that makes a difference in my life, or we they want to see what kind of other peers in our in our collaborative have to share, we encourage you to be part of it, right? That's we want a, an engaging thing of an engaging platform, let's call it that for people humans who are who are hoping for the best for other humans in their in their world and so uh if we can do that for each other and assist each other in in increasing health and wellness which is a good that can have no limit like that there is you can't have too much of it if you have health you can't have too much of health you can never be too happy too healthy too hopeful Ever. <laughs> what a nice tie it. What a nice wrap up there, Scott. Nicely done. Okay, That's my job as co-host. <laughs> okay. Take From us the home. Acapellas, my dear friend, Alan Friesen, and myself, Scott Sweetman. Thanks for joining us tonight. And if you're seeing this in, in uh, its stored form, uh, come see us live. Cause sometimes you just, it's always better live, right? Al? Always. You betcha. Get you a bet. match then. We'll see you next week, everyone. Thanks very much.